All right, so at this point, I'm about a week into tearing through the Ally and just testing it as much as I possibly can. And just like the Steam Deck, it too has its own variety of quirks and weird little things to work through to really get the best experience. Now, make no mistake, once you get down to brass tacks, the Ally is an absolutely wonderful device to play games on. But at the same time, just like I kind of predicted, there are more than a few hoops that you have to jump through to really get the best experience. So that's what today's video is all about. It's really just a collection of kind of high-level tips or things that I've noticed that I've continued to play with the Ally over the past week or so. And to make it a little bit simpler, I'm going to break it down into like three different sections of tips, right? One is just sort of general tips uh, about getting set up and actually navigating the system itself. Two is actually in-game tips that'll kind of make your experience a little bit better. And then the final one is actually a couple of troubleshooting based tips, I guess, based on some kind of problems that I ran into with the Ally over the past week or so. So with all that being said, let's just go ahead and start off with some high level tips that will just make your experience with the Ally a whole lot smoother. Now for starters, when you get the Ally, the first thing you'll have to do obviously is plug in the AC adapter and get to work setting up windows and getting through that initial setup process. And if you watched my impressions video, you know that that setup process was not exactly the smoothest as I had a variety of weird little issues with the on screen keyboard not appearing. I also had some problems with the fingerprint reader, which I'll get to a little bit later, and also some scary looking error messages where Armory Crate just decided to randomly crash during that setup, but it ended up not being a huge deal. However, at least a few of the issues that I encountered after that initial setup process probably could have been avoided if I had treated the Ally more like the Windows PC that it is, rather than the gaming device that I intended it to be. So to that end, as soon as you complete the initial setup and you actually find yourself in the Windows operating environment or the Armory Crate front end, I would say don't jump straight into installing games because that's exactly what I did and I probably could have, again, saved myself some unnecessary headaches. So fight the temptation to just immediately start installing like Xbox, GOG, Steam, Epic, whatever you're gonna install, and instead do your updates first. Because when I did it, I actually started installing games right away because I was super excited and I really didn't stop and consider that maybe there's some underlying software updates that really should be applied before I start trying to add all of this stuff to the system. So don't do what I did, instead go ahead and do the updates. Now, it is a little bit more cumbersome to perform software updates on the Ally than it is on the Steam Deck, mostly because there's at least two distinct places that you have to do them. The first thing that you'll want to do is actually dig into your Windows updates, which you can find by clicking the Start button and just typing in Update, and it should pop up the interface where you can just hit Windows Updates. And then once you get to the screen, there should be a button in the upper right where you can just click to Check for Updates. And if there are any available, just go ahead and apply them. So after you have your Windows updates in place, the next thing you'll want to do is fire up Armory Crate using the button to the right of the screen. After Armory Crate comes up, go ahead and head to the Content section, and here you can go ahead and hit the Update Center button. Just like in Windows updates, you'll find a Check for Updates button here as well, so go ahead and hit that guy. Wait and see if any new updates load up that aren't already installed on the device, and if they are available, just go ahead and install those and get them in place. So now that the Ally itself and the underlying operating system are as up to date as you can make them, now I would go ahead and start adding games to the system. And in so doing, hopefully you will avoid some of the weird issues that I encountered, like some missing Microsoft gaming prerequisites that wouldn't let me install games from Game Pass, and also some of the issues that I have with the keyboard appearing on the screen. And while we're on the subject of issues with that on-screen keyboard, next we'll take a look at some helpful shortcuts that will make navigating the Ally a whole lot easier, especially if you have to leave the Armory Crate interface and deal with something in the Windows environment. For starters, much like the Steam button on the deck, you can hold the Armory Crate button down on the right side of the screen, and that will give you a quick look at the currently assigned controls for the application that you're running. So if you hold this button down while you're in the Armory Crate interface itself, it will show you what each of the buttons do in that environment, and in the same way if you're in a game and want a quick look at how your controls function, it will break it down for you there as well. But one thing to note is that each one of the buttons on the Ally also has a secondary function associated with it, or at least it can have a secondary function associated with it. And what this means is that if you hold down the rear paddles slash macro buttons on the back and then hit one of those buttons, you can engage its secondary function. So holding your rear paddle plus D-pad up will bring up your keyboard, hitting down will bring up your task manager, left will bring up your Windows desktop, and hitting right on the D-pad will bring up your task viewer, which makes it way easier to hop between different windows that are open, which is particularly helpful if you need to hop out of Armory Crate and into something like Steam Big Picture mode without having to actually launch a game. And while I'd say the D-pad shortcuts are the most helpful, you can also use the face buttons to do some neat stuff too, like start a screen capture with Y or take a screenshot with the A button. Also, in case you forgot from the initial setup, you can move your cursor around on the Windows environment with the right analog stick and left click with the right bumper or right click with the right trigger. And of course, swiping up from the bottom of the screen will bring up the Windows taskbar. 
In a nutshell, there are a lot of helpful shortcuts that are just baked right into the Ally, and they will go a long way towards making the process of navigating that hybridized kind of Windows 11 slash Armory Crate interface a lot easier. Of course, if you want to have the most nuanced control over the operating environment, especially if you're doing a whole lot of configuration stuff for something like emulation, you may want to consider hooking up like a Bluetooth mouse and keyboard to the Ally. It's not strictly speaking necessary, but you may desire it if you find that you get sick of using the touchscreen interface and an analog stick to do all of your mousing around, so something to keep in mind. Now speaking of accessories, this next tip is pretty high level and general and honestly might be a little bit controversial if not straight up hypocritical for reasons I'll get to in a minute, but you may want to hold off on any non-essential accessories for the Ally, at least for right now. And the reason I say this is because when the Steam Deck came out, a lot of third-party manufacturers were already familiar with the device and its dimensions, so there was a lot of cool third-party stuff that was kind of available to make that experience much better right out of the gate if you didn't want to just, you know, work with whatever first-party stuff that Valve had come out with. However, with the Ally, it's not really the same thing, and if you notice, there really aren't any dedicated, you know, third-party accessories that are made specifically for the Ally just yet. So really all you can do is mess around with the first-party offerings, which are a little bit slim right now, and they may not suit your needs. And now for the hypocritical part, because speaking personally, I did go ahead and order the charging dock and the case, mostly for the purposes of making videos about them, but I am positive that better options will manifest in the next several weeks, so I'd say if you can hold off on any of the non-essential stuff that's very ally form factor specific, like cases, stands, and docks, then you probably should hold off on that stuff. Now when it comes to SD cards or backup batteries or charging cables, stuff like that's probably fine. I'm just saying if you were really seeking out stuff that was specifically tailored to the Ally form factor, you might just want to hold off a little bit because I'm positive within the next several weeks that we'll start to see some really cool stuff come out for it. Or at least I hope so, because if not, that does not bode very well for the future of the platform. Okay, so those should make your life a little bit easier when it comes to that initial setup process or just, you know, generally getting more familiar with the system itself and the stuff that you need versus the stuff that you maybe don't need right away. But next, let's go ahead and talk about some in-game tips to try to make that experience a little bit better. One thing that's been inescapable in my testing so far is that the battery life on the Ally is pretty lackluster overall. Which, I mean, I guess that makes sense, considering the device is billing itself as being twice as powerful as the Steam Deck, but still, that means unless you're cool with some really, really short play sessions in the range of an hour or so for some of the best titles you can play on the Ally, then you're going to be stuck either A, finding a way to feed it constant power through either a backup battery or by keeping it tethered to AC all the time, or B, opening up Armory Crate and then making fine-tuned adjustments to things like the FPS limiter or your screen brightness or the operating mode to make sure that it doesn't just chew through all of the available battery power in the service of, you know, better performance. Now obviously if you're playing in dock mode or tethered to an outlet, then this isn't really a concern for you. You can go ahead and push every graphical preset as high as you possibly can and battery life just isn't going to be a big deal. However, if you're like me and you tend to prefer to play these systems in the handheld form factor, well then you've got a couple of options available to you. The first is you just go brute force and get a huge beefy backup battery to make sure it can keep feeding power to the ally for as long as you want to play, which in many cases can effectively double or maybe triple your battery life if you've got a really big battery, but personally what I did was I went ahead and ordered the Anker 737 recently. Now this thing is just a beast of a battery and after looking through a few posts on Reddit, it appears to deliver enough power to trigger the 30 watt turbo mode that normally you can only get while docked up or tethered to the power supply. Weirdly, I figured my original Anker power core that I got for the Steam Deck would definitely be able to do this, but it didn't for some reason and after doing a little bit of digging on the forums, it looks like this is a known issue that Asus is currently working to address because apparently a lot of people have tried to use various docks, chargers, and batteries that fulfill that 65 watt requirement, but are still finding that the operating mode is stuck at 25 watts instead of the 30 watt turbo mode that makes games look their absolute best. However, after testing the Anker 737, I can confirm that this one definitely does deliver the 30 watt turbo mode, so you can actually get the best visual fidelity without having to stay either docked up or tethered to an AC outlet. Now I have affiliate link this below in the description if you want to grab one for yourself, but regardless of whether you go with the 737 or a power core or just another battery that's capable of getting in that 65 watt range, whether you're on 30 or 25 watt delivery, it will still extend your playtime by 2-3 to three hours if you can play while you have it connected to something like this. I mean, provided you don't mind having a giant battery hooked up to your ally like some kind of electronic IV bag. But if you don't feel like going the battery route, there are some things that you can do in Command Center to help extend the playtime a little bit. If you just go ahead and hit the Command Center button to the left of the screen, here you can do some experimentation with your operating mode. When I was playing Killer Frequency the other night, I found that I could still get pretty solid performance running it at the 15 watt performance mode without a major frame rate hit. And on the subject of frame rates, you can also limit your FPS here to eke out some extra playtime. And something else that you can do to try to make sure the battery doesn't take too big of a hit is to go ahead and drop your screen brightness. Pretty straightforward. Now obviously there isn't a one-size-fits-all power-to-performance solution since this will largely depend on how well optimized any title is, and also your personal tolerances for what is or isn't an acceptable frame rate or level of visual fidelity. 
but grabbing an external battery and or tweaking the command center settings to make sure that the ally will sip rather than gulp all of the available energy to it should help out tremendously. And beyond doing some manual power management, you also do have access to FSR and RSR in the ally. Well, FSR is technically something that I believe is implemented on a per title basis, but if a game doesn't support FSR, which will allow you to do some upscaling, you do have RSR available at the system level. Now, this is a feature that I've only experimented with a little bit, and I'm not positive I have a great understanding of it, but from what I've read on it and what I've seen just messing around with it a little bit, apparently the way it works is you take a game and you set its resolution to something like 1280 by 720. Then you can enable RSR, and that will actually take that image and upscale it to 1920 by 1080. So you kind of get sharper visual fidelity, but at the same time you're not taxing system performance too hard. At least, again, I think I got that right. I'm still kind of new to this, so if you have a better explanation for it, please do let me know in the comments below. All right, so we went over a couple of general things in the interest of kind of smoothing out the ally experience overall. Then we looked at some of the performance and power stuff to kind of make the in-game experience a little bit better. But now I just want to cover a couple of weird little troubleshooting things at the system level that I ran into while I was getting familiar with the ally. And hopefully they'll be helpful for you as well. The first of which is the problem with the fingerprint scanner. Again, apparently I wasn't the only one who experienced this. A lot of you pointed out in the comments that other reviewers had seen this as well. But after I'd kind of gotten rolling with getting through the Windows 11 setup process and did my whole fingerprint setup, for reasons unknown to me, after a couple of reboots, it just stopped accepting the fingerprint. So here's how to re-enable the fingerprint if you're having problems with it. Do a search in Windows for Windows Security and open up the Windows Security app. From here, tap on the Account Protection option here on the left. Under Windows Hello, tap Sign In Options. And from this screen, you can tap on the Fingerprint Recognition setting to get to the Add a Fingerprint button to re-register your fingerprint. After I went back through this process, I was able to log back in using just biometrics the way I originally did. And finally, this last tip is a weird one that probably is not going to be helpful to anybody out there who's a Windows PC veteran, but if you're somebody who got this device hoping to use it exactly like a gaming device, not too unlike the Steam Deck, it might catch you off guard, and that is how to get into and out of the BIOS. And the reason I'm bringing this up specifically is because randomly, for reasons unknown to me, I'm assuming because of some sort of a firmware update or something that I had applied, I went to power on the Ally the other day and instead of going into the Windows environment, it went straight to the BIOS. Now I knew exactly what this was as soon as I saw it, but if you're somebody who was just expecting to see the Windows environment and you'd never really interacted with the BIOS or something like that before, again, because you're treating this as like a gaming device, not too unlike a console rather than the PC that it is, that can probably catch you by surprise. So if you do encounter something similar where you randomly get placed into the Allies BIOS, just hit the B button to bring up the Exit Without Saving dialog box, and then hit OK to boot into Windows normally. However, if you're a more advanced user, or at least a more adventurous user, and you need to get into the BIOS for some reason, whenever you're turning on the system, just make sure you hold the down volume button while you hold the power button, and that should get you into the BIOS if you need to make changes there. Alright, and that's it for this video. I'm sure I will come across more quirks in the Ally as time goes on, especially as I start tinkering with it to do things like emulation, but all of the tips that I talked about today were either things that I found directly helpful, or I'm sure in time I will find them helpful, because having quick access, especially to get to like Task Manager to force kill like a stubborn process in Windows, is always a comforting thing to have around. So, anyways, this is hardly a comprehensive list, but if you have any questions, or if there's something I didn't cover very well, or if you have your own insights or think I could have explained something better, please do let me know in the comments below. As always, thank you so much for your time and watching the videos here, it means a lot to me. Take care, and I'll see you next time. Bye.